Dr. Sudaka and KL Chong from MyMed Advisors. So uh, the topic today is, is solar energy really green? Right? What we see is, okay, solar energy, it, it requires just sunlight to produce electricity. So there's no emission, there's no carbon dioxide or any uh, gases that are produced. There's practically no emission at all when we produce that energy. But is that really the case? Right. So, um, with me today, let me introduce the two speakers for today. Right. Uh, K.L. Chong on my left. Right. Mr. K.L. Chong is the founder and executive director of MyMap Advisors. K.L. Chong has been active in corporate finance and infrastructure finance advisory uh, across different industries as well in Malaysia since 2006. Right. He is active in the Asia region for various corporate finance advisory such as IPO privatizations of listed companies, M&As, debt capital markets, infrastructure financing, and so on and so forth. Among the markets that he's familiar with is Malaysia, China, Singapore, India, Vietnam, Laos, Pakistan, Indonesia also, right? right? So, yeah, KL Chong, okay? And I have Dr. Sudaka here uh, from UK, uh, UDC Malaya Pahang. Right. Uh, Dr. Sudaka has a very long CV, so what I'll do is I'll summarize it a little. He is an academician, a senior lecturer with, uh, at the Faculty of Mechanical and Automotive Engineering Technology and a researcher at Automotive Engineering and Fluid Center in UC Malaya, Pahang. His primary research areas include technologies for sustainable development, solar, thermal, PV systems, energy modeling, feasibility and performance evaluation of clean and renewable energy projects, and sustainability of energy systems. Right. He has received numerous prestigious academic awards, including, oh, this is a long list, uh, Best Faculty Award, Department of Science uh, and Technology, Government of India, uh, British Council Youngest Climate Leader Award, Madhya Pradesh Young Scientist Award, Young South Asian Researcher Award on Sustainable Consumption and Production and by Terry University, and many others. <laughs> right. uh, he has supervised nine PhD students and more than 40, 45 master's students in both India and Malaysia, and is leading a team of 15 members consisting of PhD, uh, master's and undergraduate students. Right. And he has been cited uh, published more than 160 journal papers and cited over 7,000 times uh, over the past five years only. Right. So, welcome to both of you. Right. Okay, back to the question earlier. Right. Uh, we know solar energy doesn't produce any emission, but it, is it really green? Uh, maybe I'll get uh, Dr. Sudaka. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, a very great evening to all the audience over here. Uh, this session is slightly different uh, from all the sessions which has happened since morning. <laughs> because also it's a closing session. Most of you would be interested to leave the hall and, <laughs> and go back to your uh, home. But I hope this session will be much more interesting to you. Uh, because the question posed here is whether it's green and sustainable. Uh, no doubt it is green. Why it's green? Because it's a nature, it's actually coming from the earth, from the sun, and uh, the life on the earth is itself coming from the sun. So there is no point to question, is it green or sustainable? So maybe the question will be on sustainability aspects. So sustainability is something different, which I will come to the next part of the argument. <laughs> but it, of course, green. Why it's green? Because it's coming from the nature, and it is not going to have any kind of environmental impact if we could harness this source of energy without uh, disturbing our mother nature. So it is definitely one of the best source we have. And sun is something which is universal for the whole world. Uh, it doesn't belong to India or China or any other country. So and also, uh, it is also green and uh, the life is also the earth itself. If you take, it actually belongs to all the world. So it belongs to all the countries. So therefore, I would say, uh, solar is something totally green, we should accept the fact. But there are some other countries which say coal and oil is gas, will be the greener uh, solution. It's not at all that. Uh, solar is always green and is going to be green. 
I'll come into the other points, how it can be green uh, in the next uh, few uh, topics. Uh, I'll just pass on to... Hello. Um, I, I have, personally, I will have slightly different from what uh, Doc say on 100% green. Uh, to me, uh, looking at it, you know, in any form of energy, uh, that will not be a 100% green, per se. Okay, uh, just I look at it from the perspective. You, you, when you produce a solar panel, you know, and whether it's silicon or thin, flim, whatever technology you use, you, use, you need the minerals, coppers, nickels. So, so from the upstream side of it, then you have some form of mining activities. So this mining activity is a green and sustainable manner, then you bring the solar panel into it. So then you ask a question, is, is the solar is it green energy? Uh, then I'll leave it to the audience. <laughs> You know, so you need to look at the entire value chain, you know. So to me, that, that, that is whether green or not green, you know, per se. But as I say, started off, all sorts of energy that we are using, hydro, whatever, you need some form of, of equipment to put into it. So I think we, we just need to look at it, uh, how, how much or how low it damage to the environment, you know, per se, in generating the, the, the power. Okay, uh, thanks, Chong. Uh, as as Chong, you have mentioned, you know, uh, for solar, if you look at the entire life cycle, there is, uh, you know, the materials or minerals that are mined, um, and also to the end of life. So maybe what happens at the end of life of solar panels? What happens to uh, those panels? new approach called uh, circular economy approach. That is what we have to focus on uh, solar because uh, solar has got limited life. That is 21 years of life. And beyond that, we don't have any market plans actually. So how we uh, scale up or how do we reuse this technology? So coming back to that topic also green, uh, it is 100% going to be green in future because uh, now with the new developments of solar technologies, which are coming from perovskites, uh, organic, and uh, nature-inspired solution, uh, solar can be 100% green because there is no point of mining uh, raw materials from sand or something else. It can come from the nature itself. So thereby, in future, it can be 100% green. There, uh, there is, I agree with uh, my colleague that uh, there, is, uh, there is a problem because we still extract uh, some of the metals and it's also having some impact. But in the coming years of time, we are at a point where uh, we'll be reaching an efficiency of 33%. So that is the theoretical limit of uh, solar cell efficiency. If we could achieve that limit of 33% with the uh, organic based uh, uh, solar cell development, and if we can actually recycle this solar cell after 21 years of life, that is called end of life cycle management, recycling, reuse, because uh, current solar projects uh, to some extent there may be argument that it's not sustainable. Why? Because after 21 years, we don't have plan for its reuse or uh, recycling. So one way of making it completely sustainable is after 21 years, making the system more efficient and reusing it. Almost all the components can be recycled. I would say at least 60 to 70% of the component of the solar system uh, would be uh, recyclable. And there is plenty of opportunities on this, uh, this aspect, especially circular economy aspect and recycling of solar cell technologies, because we are now in 2022, in three years of time, the technology is going to evolve. Because in the morning, I heard about bifacial technologies. So today only, uh, there is the largest bifacial technology solar farm is coming up. Now monocrystalline itself is going to be outdated. Polycrystalline is of course already outdated. So we are now moving into a new era of uh, so many advancement in solar cell technologies, thin film technologies, uh, organic based solar technologies, transparent solar cells for building. So of course there are new new developments coming uh, and another few years you will see tremendous uh, uh, developments. In fact there is a talk on wireless energy transmission. So if you talk about wireless transfer there is no need of transmission and distribution network. Uh, it can be transferred continuously through microwave and all these things. So thereby there will be a continuous uh, use of power uh, without any uh, 
uh, additional resources, so thereby the solar can be totally green, can be recycled further. So this is my take on recycling and circular economy approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you. But um, Dr. Sudaka, you mentioned about uh, the technologies being uh, available. But um, uh, yeah, uh, the technologies are available, but are, are they really uh, commercially viable? Uh, would they be, uh, you know, uh, we can recycle glass, but a lot of people don't do that because um, it is quite expensive to do that. But uh, how about, uh, you know, if you look at the, the solar panels, uh, there's glass and there's silicon. Um, how commercially viable is it to recycle these uh, products? Yeah, th that is also a question because uh, the best of solar is yet to come. Uh, because what technology we have today uh, is not going to be the future technologies. This is, we are in the actually, I can say it, a kind of a cusp of transition. Even solar technology itself is undergoing transition. Uh, so we talk about energy transition from coal, oil, and gas to solar. But I would say in a different perspective, where solar itself is undergoing transition. The way we are going to use solar energy will be totally different. We'll be using it for uh, uh, small, scale, small scale projects. Uh, we are talking in terms of large scale to power our grid and so on. Uh, in future, I, I have a different perspective of using solar. Solar will be at your desktop. Solar will be at your building. Imagine this building. Uh, you are powering all your devices wirelessly. Uh, no point in having a cable to do that. And imagine a building getting illuminated with solar energy artificially from microwaves and all. So that kind of uh, things are going to happen. So that may happen in three, four years of time, uh, because this solar large scale projects which we are talking today, in four to five years of time it may be absolute. Uh, because we have new, new innovations coming up in, in uh, overseas, in European market. Of course, it can easily go into Indian and Chinese market. Why? Because it's scale. Uh, so why Chinese and Indian markets are so big? Because of the scale of project. And they can easily innovate and do it in a very lower cost. So that is the reason why Indian and Chinese products are very faster to reach than the other one. So therefore, the scale of use and all these things will definitely bring down the cost of uh, these uh, new innovations, especially in three years of time. Uh, today, we have solar cell efficiency of maximum 25, I feel. So it can, uh, we need to reach at 30% efficient. So I hope uh, it will be in three years of time you will get it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chong, um, currently one of the ways to, to improve, um, you know, the, 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 the viability of uh, solar is through battery energy because uh, then we can use solar for a longer period of time, right? So, uh, in, your, in, your, in your view, is battery energy storage uh, viable? Uh, whether it's battery or hydrogen storage in battery or hydrogen, it's just a different uh, kind of battery. Um, how, how, how viable do you think uh, it will become in terms of costs in the new future? Energy storage, I think over the years, I think uh, uh, many industry players here are aware of that you know, the technology keep on evolving. In back then, in the those days, you know, we, we, one of the main challenges is that for solar or wind farm, we, we generate the electricity, but sometimes we may not use it at all. So where the electricity storage uh, solution come in? I think over the year, you look at the development in China, or particularly, I think the electricity storage um, technology are improving in a quantum leap kind of uh, speed. You know, so therefore, it make now the, the solar energy, wind energy, even more palatable and bankable in, in many sense. You know, so because you need to match it back with with, with the you know. Uh, in the daytime, you know, the consumption of electricity is a lot, you know. So, like solar, you know, at night, uh, you may not able to, you know, generate electricity. But people even now talking about how to generate electricity via solar at night time. They are the talk on, on, on this topic here. So, then, uh, solid, electricity solid system will become a center part of, of this, the whole, whole RE in the solar, solar energy. Okay, thank you, Chong. Um, as just uh, now, Dr. Sudaka mentioned, uh, there are technologies coming in in the future uh, uh, that will mitigate the impact of uh, solar uh, being 
sustainable, right? Uh, but what can we do currently uh, while waiting for those technology to come in um, to, to mitigate those impact of um, you know, uh, it being uh, less green than it? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Of course, uh, since morning I heard a lot about transparency, openness, openness is all these things. So, so that is one area I think Malaysia should focus uh, more on transparency, more on openness so that anybody can come and install the project, especially in the rooftop segment. I think a lot of work to be done, community scale projects. Uh, because uh, we were also struggling to put solar projects in our campus. Uh, communities are largest user of solar. So it can be in schools, colleges, universities. Uh, it can be place of worship because we have a lot of mosques, a lot of temples, a lot of church. So these are the community areas where we need to focus, where uh, the solar can be implemented easily. For example, airports. Airport is also one of the community areas we can focus. So these kind of projects doesn't need any land. So we need to focus on community projects and small scale projects also in addition to large scale. So that will open up a lot of markets in Malaysia. So the, the application of solar should be more towards the community, towards the people than uh, the large scale. Of course, the large scale is going to be the uh, one which, uh, which can help us, but, but we also should focus on equally the application of solar in different areas. In fact, solar cooking, solar, uh, uh, because women's, it can help in um, a lot of uh, problems in LPG and all we are using. So solar fuels can be a play a role. And of course, the uh, Romanian partner is here. Actually, we are also working on so offshore solar platforms where we can convert these existing platforms into solar islands, where we can solve uh, food, water, fuel. All these issues can be solved. You can produce desalination. You can produce water. You, using aquaculture, you can solve the problem of food. And of course, through solar, you can solve the problem of electricity. So using our offshore oil and gas wells and other things, we can actually solve the problem of food, water, energy. All these three problems can be solved. And it can be much more sustainable in future because uh, my vision of sustainability is something different. Uh, because sustainability is something which is actually balancing economic, environmental, and social aspects. Actually, it will be a level playing field between developing country and developed nations. Why some of the countries are called developed? Because they are oil-rich countries, they are selling the oil and they are making rich. But solar is one which is actually going to create a level playing field across the world. So which will balance the disparity between rich and poor. In fact, uh, the country which is going to use maximum of solar, they can be a much more developed country in future. That is my take on solar as sustainable energy source. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chong, do you have any uh, things to add on to that, uh, what can we improve? Uh, what, what can we do to in, order, in order to mitigate those impacts? I think just now I have some discussion with some of the um, Sora uh, owner, the developer. I think it's quite interesting uh, discussion, which also come to my heart on this thing, you know. Uh, from uh, my web advisor is really much on, on the, the infrastructure uh, project advisory. So I will take this point from the perspective of, of the you know, feasibility uh, perspective in, in the, of, of this solar here. So currently, I think like most people here, I think now solar, solar project like Malaysia, like LSS1 until now 4, like everybody you know, moving into the solar space uh, for RE. But, uh, a lot of consideration, uh, you know, a lot of people, I don't know whether some people whether have you think about it, have you put inside in, in your financial fiscal study, you know, like your PV West, after 20 years, you know, now you, we, we could not see this, you know, after 20 years, what happened to all this uh, uh, solar panel? How are we going to dispose of, you know, you have all this uh, hazardous matter, if you don't deal with it properly, that will be very harmless to the environment. So, like those old days, like in, in Australia, when you're doing the mining, usually we have a decommi decommissioning, you know, restoration. So, uh, in the project life cycle, we already accounting for all the costs and, and this aspect. But back to here, when, when we do the feasibility on, on the solar, do we account for all this? Your line, end of the life cycle disposal, have we accounted for it in our feasibility study? Otherwise, later on, then this cost, who can take on on this cost? So that will go back to your payback, your equity IRR, and all things like that, the evaluation that you are carry on. I think perhaps this, this I, think, I think hopefully, you know, all the 
from the investor perspective, from the developer perspective, you know, you, you need to think about all those things, you know, in your financial fee study on the solar. Um, another thing perhaps I need to add on is, uh, perhaps it's, uh, just now I think this morning we are talking about the land, land use. So um, that's another perspective of it, you know, uh, sometimes I, I, I pass by certain highway, I uh, saw so next to me is the solar panel already. So to me, it's quite a wasteful, you know. It's a good asset to the land, but we put out our panel, solar panel. You know, for 30 years, 20 years, you know, he's doing nothing there. Of course, yes, it generates electricity, you know. There, there are other uses, you know, it's just like, just like uh, some, someone shared with me, you know, what happened in, in Taiwan, for example. They, they elevate up all, all the solar panel, and down there, the land they can use for chicken farming or duck farming. So that from the sustainability uh, perspective, you have the food sustainability, you have the RE, via the solar. So this guy thinking that, I think a little bit of innovation in terms of the solar development. It's quite, quite consistent with what uh, Dr. Sudaka mentioned, right? Uh, it's uh, you know, uh, using for food, using for uh, energy needs as well. Right? Um, I think uh, we are a bit short on time really. So um, any, any message that you, you'd like to you know, share with the audience on the, uh, you know, what we need to do in order to make um, uh, solar energy more sustainable, more green? Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's a very interesting topic to finish off. Uh, one problem with uh, Malaysia, I could see, is about awareness. Uh, because being in academics, I know very much the problem faced by the teachers to convince the students. <laughs> Uh, so when I talk to the students, they are more electrical engineers, sometimes they are more mechanical engineers, sometimes more civil engineers. So civil engineers are more interested in building. Mechanical engineers are more interested in missions. Electrical engineers related to power system. Actually, we need to link all these engineers to come and work in the field of energy because energy is one which is basic necessity and it's energy is going beyond so many things actually. Energy, food, water, health this become a basic necessity of mankind. If engineers and scientists can provide a solution to all these problems, then the world will be a much better place. So therefore, I would say all these engineers uh, should work together, cross-disciplinary approach, interdisciplinary approach is what needed, because if academics can create a quality manpower, and these manpower are, will be used by the business who are actually employing them, uh, so that is one which uh, we are lagging, that's we are trying to do at our level, at university level. So, of course, when it comes to the industries, uh, they should be more, much more employable. Therefore, uh, I would say more of awareness, more of dissemination, more of interdisciplinary approach. Uh, these kind of stuffs are very much needed uh, to make them more employable in the industrial market. And, of course, there are new, new applications coming, solar in agriculture, solar in vehicles, and so on. Because Malaysia is more about automobiles. So how we can use solar in uh, automobiles, how solar can be used as a fuel also, like biohydrogen, bio CNG and so on, all these aspects has to be uh, researched and find a solution. Uh, so these are the way I wish uh, uh, Malaysia can be sustainable and there is a lot of growth in the coming years uh, to Malaysia to be a net carbon zero very soon because uh, this is uh, a place where it's already green, 40% is already forest cover. So it's only rest 60% we have to make it more uh, sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Chong, any uh, last message you'd like to share? Yeah. Uh, I think green is, is something, is a, is a big topic. It's very subjective in, in, to different people, you know. So in terms of sustainability, you know, we need to look at a even wider aspect of it. So um, I think it's everyone efforts, you know, down from individual to corporate to government, you know, all the stakeholders got to work together, you know, to ensure a, a, a green, resilient, you know, sustainable, you know, living environment for, for this earth. Okay. Thank you, Chong. Um, I invite the audience to give a round of applause to the two speakers here. Thank you very much. That's very insightful. I'll pass it back to Noel.